I will begin this lecture by quoting an event which took place in 1948 in the wake of the foundation of the UNESCO organization. Although it's mostly concerned art histories, this event may be transposed into the domain of architecture. In 1948, the AICA, that is the International Association of Art Critics, a non-governmental organization founded in, 1980, uh, in 1948, sorry, held its first congress under the patronage of the UNESCO. The participants stated that one of the goals of their organization, of the AICA, was to collect a coherent and systematic documentation on art criticism, and particularly to collect the writings of art critics. They considered that this material, stemming from contemporary art criticism, was the fundamental material for an important task in the present and the future, the writing of contemporary art history. During this Congress, which gathered together art critics and art historians, the French art historian Pierre Francastel, who, by the way, was the author of Art and Technology in the 19th and 20th century, um, a bit later in the 50s, which remained in France in the 50s the only historical handbook which evoked 20th century architecture. I have to say that France had really remained back uh, in this pe peculiar domain. So Pierre Francastel tackled the issue of the new questions that contemporary art production raises. In Francastel's view, only the material offered by living and contemporary art criticism could help the art historian to tackle these issues. Similarly, the historiography of contemporary architecture has very often relied on critical writings, articles of critics, on articles of architectural magazines. On the opposite, in 1975, in his magazine La Revue de l'Art, the French art historian André Chastel sing, signed an editorial which sounded the alarm about the means of the conservation of archive of the 20th century architecture. Most historians, archivists, and museum curators who had taken part in this adventure of collecting this archive have asserted that in the 80s, from the 80s onwards, archives of contemporary architecture, namely those of the 20th century, finally and happily enabled historians, architectural historians, to practice their discipline without relying anymore on architectural criticism on its texts. They claimed that it enabled historians to be finally independent of criticism and of critics. So, we may outline two opposite statements. On the one hand, uh, one that uses criticism as one of the more useful and significant material for writing history. On the other hand, the second asserts that history has to be independent from the critique engagé or from operative criticism, to use Manfredo Tafuri's words. Indeed, a significant part of the history of the 19th and 20th century's architecture has been written according to the unique source of periodicals. Um, we can see that, um, therefore, we can see that using architectural magazines may represent a fundamental aspect of writing history. Of course, I'm not claiming to give a response to this ambitious and large questions that the relationship between uh, criticism and the writing on history. Instead, I have numerous questions to raise. Among those questions, I would ask, what kind of history do we write when we rely on criticism on its text, and more specifically, when we rely on periodicals? How might this source be used for history of the present time? In this intellectual, uh, is this intellectual approach satisfactory for historians? Is architectural publication only a source for architectural historians, or is it, um, is it itself an object of historical study, an object of historical um, inquiry? Since this lecture is addressed to master and doctoral students who may use uh, this periodical as a source, I would like to give some more elements on their history. 
I will specially focus on the interwar period. My goal is not to reconstruct the theoretical statements, the architectural contents and the topics of criticism that those journals have conveyed. Instead, I will attempt to outline common features of those periodicals to give, I will attempt to give a synthetic idea of their identity as journals, which is a bit more difficult. Um, uh, my first part is entitled The Periodical as a Genre in Search for a Typology. Um, from the threshold of the 20th century to 1970, diverse kinds of periodicals have forged their own identity in regard to the architectural modernity, whether or not these magazines have subscribed to modernist architecture and to its relation to society and environment. However, Modern architectural magazines don't show any unity as to their goals or to their discourse, even in the period of, we could say, rise and fall of modernity from the beginning of the century to the 70s. In fact, there have been much more types of magazines in the 20th century alone as in the 19th century. We can mention, for instance, innovative magazine of the period of Art Nouveau, dedicated to decorative art, manifesto magazine of, avant -garde, of the avant-garde groups in the 20s, technical periodicals, trade periodicals in the USA after the war, or theoretical magazine originating in, the depart in departments of architecture in American universities uh, since the 60s, um, even more in the 70s, and from the 60s onwards, the return of the avant-garde, we can also mention the little magazines uh, recently um, highlighted by Beatrice Colomena in her research and exhibitions of, on a click, uh, clip stamp fold, and so forth. And above all, especially in Europe, during the 20th century, there has been a great number of magazines which were professional and critical as well, like, this is only an example, l'architecture d'aujourd'hui. So, confronted with the diversity, with this diversity, it would be an illusion to define the identity or the concept of an architectural periodical in the 20th century. What may be called canonical forms of the architecture magazine, which is an heterone heterogeneous genre, genre in the confluence of technical press, professional press, and art publishing. This genre has stabilized in the 19th century from 1840 to 1880. And one of the, there are two uh, very important magazines, one English, the architectural magazine, which was one of the first established uh, professional periodical. And uh, on the French side, on the right, uh, you can see um, a cover of the Revue Générale de l'Architecture et des Travaux Publics of César Dali, uh, which was published from 1840 to 1889, uh, and which is considered in French historiography as the real uh, model, as the real uh, first professional, first uh, um, very stable, important professional magazine. Uh, so um, this pattern of the professional magazine remain rather stable for leading professional periodical even until the Second World War. At the beginning of the 20th century, periodicals of the decor decorative art of the Art Nouveau were at the forefront of the upheavals of architectural publication, namely, namely because of their uh, graphic design and also because of their openness to architectural international trends. For instance, in Italy, uh, Arte Decorativa Moderna uh, was uh, very open to uh, um, international uh, architecture to German Austrian architecture. It was not really the case, or it was less the case of other periodicals li uh, like uh, 
uh, architettura italiana, uh, for instance. So these periodicals of the art decorative took a great part in uh, renovating um, the debate, but also in renovating uh, the, uh, the relations between word on the image in the magazine, or renovating the graphic design, the graphic layout, so it was really important in my view to, um, to begin to, to install new models of periodicals. Um, however, magazines originating in other domains of the artistic life took a noticeable part to modify the modalities of publishing architecture. As soon as the uh, 1910s, Notably from the futurism, futurism avant-garde journals dedicate a significant space to new architecture. Then, uh, in France, uh, L'Esprit Nouveau, uh, in uh, um, uh, Hungary, Ma, uh, in Budapest, in Austria, and also uh, a lot of uh, uh, the importance we have to uh, to mention the importance of a lot of architectural, no, avant-garde magazines stemming from the uh, Central Europe uh, countries which were innovating uh, also the, on, not only the debate but also the graphic design in accord to uh, the upheavals of graphics and uh, uh, of this, uh, uh, of these countries in, in, in relation to constructivists. Um, so, uh, there, there were a lot of, of new magazines in this period, uh, for instance, Ma on Vext uh, by Elisitsky on Ilya Renburg. Um, uh, Vext was an international platform of expression and exchange for the multiple trend of constructivism on a bridge between West and East, and that's also very important, the circulation of the ideas. Architecture is not necessarily at the center of their editorial policy. In the second half of the 20s, some newly founded magazines deal more directly with architecture and construction. In a rather pragmatic approach, I mean, for instance, ABC by Träger zum Bauen, a, a contribution to, for construction, uh, on Bauhaus, um, the Dutch E-10, and Last, the, on a, it, it was a, uh, a bit later, the Spanish AC uh, Documentos de Actividad Contemporanea, uh, which was very close uh, to das Neue Frankfurt. Uh, as for its graphic designs and also for its architectural contents, all these magazines renovated the field. Uh, they were not really avant-garde magazine it, it, because they, they were more uh, dedicated to, they, they wanted really to, to have an action on, on the reality, and they were not uh, only um, um, editing manifestos and, and declarations, but they, 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 as da, Das Neue Frankfurt, they, they wanted really to, to, to report uh, the, the reality of the activity in the, in the, in the town of Frankfurt by Ernst May. Um, those periodicals um, advocate the more radical rationalisms in the late 20s. The struggle for a realist architecture which relies on new methods of construction. They deal with urban planning, financial aspects of the dwelling problems. This is namely the case of Das Neue Frankfurt. Uh, in my view, this turning point between avant-garde radical magazines and more established uh, reviews is a very interesting moment, which should be more investigated. I will take the example of Belgian journals. In Belgium, many architectural journals have been founded in the interwar period. First, in the wake of the war, some of them dedicated to new architecture, uh, like Hut Oversicht in Antwerpen, uh, from 1921 to 1925, uh, or also De Kunde, De Driehoek, and Setar in Brussels, and so many others. Some of those might be easily identified as avant-garde. As for the Brussels magazine La Cité, uh, the historian Franz van Latem 
wrote in 2003 in a very important uh, article on Belgian magazines. It's in, in French and in Dutch and not in English. <laughs> and she, she, she wrote, I quote uh, Franz van Latten, La Cité has an ambiguous status. At the same time, a professional magazine on a critical one, which publishes the last architectural trends, unquote. Another Belgian journal may be mentioned as well, Le Caire, founded in 1928. In 1930, the editors of Le Caire asserted that their magazine had joined after three years only, and I quote uh, the editorial of Le Caire, uh, that we have joined the cohort of the major, moder major sorry, modernist magazines which have already annihilated the army of the retrogrades, unquote. From the outset, Le Caire does not position itself as one of the trailblazers which has campaigned to impose a radical avant-garde architecture. It rather positions itself as a major modernist magazine. And that's important because it's not more uh, the, the idea of a, of a fight for architecture, but uh, the idea of being in the uh, concreteness, the reality of the new architecture. The collaborators of Le Caire have had the foresight to place themselves and act at the turning point of the history of modern architecture. While, spe while specific to the history of the Liège-based magazine, this transformation is, in my view, symptomatic of the changes affecting the print media established in support to the modern movement at the very end of the 20s. One could do, uh, one could, uh, do similar observation uh, about French and Italian periodicals which have been founded in the late 20s as L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui, Casabella and Dormos. Taking advantage of the example of those magazines at the frontier between avant-garde and more established professional journals, we must stress the issue of the types of generation uh, of magazine during this period. That is the point I'm going to question in the next part of my, in the next part of my talk. So, uh, can we sketch a profile of avant-garde journals? I have to say that most of scholarship of architectural periodical consists of monographs on a peculiar journal. Only rarely, architectural historians have tackled the, the definition of types, genre, or even generations of periodicals. Some 30 years ago, the Swiss historian Jacques Gubler, often one of the most decisive contributions, that's a a title I put in the bibliography, it's a very important issue of Rassegna on periodicals. Um, drawing upon a reflection on the etymology of the word avant-garde from military to politics, Gubler mentions the essential means of militant action. The avant-garde journal publishes manifesto, heralds the birth of groups, and ensures their ideological cohesion, coherence even. Goebbelers' demonstration dealt not so much with the aesthetic or architectural contents of these journals. Those, jo those contents can be very dissimilar from one journal to another. And I'll, as you studied uh, many examples of journals, you can also observe that the contents may, very dis may be very dissimilar. But what interest uh, uh, Goebbeler was interest, interested in another thing. Uh, he was interested in uh, drawing a kind of uh, identity of these journals. Um, among the common features of the avant-garde journal, their production conditions rank among the most determining factors. For instance, the exchanges, the financial precariousness of this uh, reviews, the instability of the group of artists and architects who managed them were among this common feature. One can also mention the often extremely short life of these titles, sometimes reduced to only one issue, and this is the case, for instance, of a, um, a Cercle Carré, who was founded by a Belgian critic, Michel Sofort. There was one issue. And, the, and for the defense of a, of a new architecture. 
then another feature, a very important feature of Avant-Garde magazine is the multilingual and international, and even one can say the internationalism or in the political sense of the term of, uh, of this journal is also a fundamental aspect. Another feature is the mobility of authors on their collaboration to, to journals in various countries, the exchanges, the frequent reproduction of articles in foreign languages directly taken from a journal to another without authorization sometimes. Um, so the frequent reproduction of articles in foreign languages, uh, all these uh, kind of actions are typical of avant-garde magazine. The international dimension is based on the quest for a universal language that would transcend the borders. I would add to Goebbels observation that such an international dimension on its image is far from stemming from a systematic organization. For instance, um, th there, were no, uh, there were not uh, systematically an editorial board on an established network of correspondence. It's more like a kind, sometimes a kind of bricolage, no? uh, which relies on personal networks and also um, um, this journal um, strive to give an overestimating image of their international dimension. However, the avant-garde on architecture periodical lists a large number of correspondents, or like does the, 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 the French journal Manometre, uh, some, um, uh, they also give the image of a other friend, uh, friendly magazine or also a friendly in bookshop in foreign countries. And it, it, they want to evoke uh, a network of journals published in, in the European centers of the avant-garde, um, from Hanover to Rome via Cracovia and Trieste, whether this network may exist or not. It is possible uh, to compare this uh, with the system uh, set up uh, a few years later by Das Neue Frankfurt. Uh, das Neue Frankfurt was a showcase for the policy of city planning and housing conducted by the architect Ernst May in Frankfurt from 25 to 31. Das Neue Frankfurt publishes issues on art, photography, cinema, and art education. Indeed, cultural events in general fit within the representation of the modern metropolis that this magazine strives to express and to support. The magazine frequently publishes pages with the heading Bilderberichte, that is, visual narratives, from the major European capitals. These Bilderberichte of visual narratives thus help include the new Frankfurt, uh, the city of Frankfurt in the network of European capitals, Berlin and Paris in particular. Summarizing the choice made by correspondents and critics, these pages, Bilderberichte, uh, uh, form a series of images combining art events new buildings, pictures from films, and images taken from exhibitions. In those reports, images play a major role, which in turn illustrates the periodical's part in the international avant-garde. Since numerous artists were also photographers, typographers of graphic designers and architects as well, the printed magazine becomes an aesthetic product in its own right. It's not anymore only the vehicle for, its, for this aesthetic. Uh, this is the example of a um, Dutch magazine at the beginning of the 20s. It was when, uh, Vendingen, which was very close to the Amsterdam School. Uh, the graphic experiment carried out by the artists as, re as regard to typography, photography, and collage photomontage um, here by uh, Dutch um, uh, artists and architects, but uh, these were this were even stronger in um, magazines stemming from the constructivist era. Uh, these experiments transform the way a periodical is designed. 
Uh, it was namely a break in regard to the tradition of daily newspapers whose space were divided into columns, uh, constructed symmetrically, etc. Uh, so uh, the, the newspaper codes initially had shaped the professional periodical uh, graphic design of the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, so, uh, so magazines like uh, uh, the Dutch uh, uh, Eatin, uh, the Swiss ABC, or Das Neue Frankfurt uh, expressed a clear stance for the correspondence between the visual form of the printed document of the new conception in, archi in architecture. The visual form was then a part of their editorial policy. For instance, in Eatin on, on Das Neue Frankfurt, uh, on in D form, numerous articles witness the interest for, for the upheavals of photography on typography. Moreover, book designers like Al Lisitsky or Johannes Molzan supported the idea that reading had become a dynamic movement across the double page. The double page formed a new visual and perceptive unit of the book. Uh, this is a book um, 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 uh, which is, uh, uh, whose graphic design is done by Johannes Molzan. Uh, it's uh, about um, maxed out uh, buildings and, and um, plans and written by uh, the critic Adolf Bene. And uh, in this book, uh, Molzan experimented this conception of the uh, double page as, as a perceptive unit and uh, uh, the idea that um, uh, the composition of the page relies on the movement of the eyes. It can, sort of imit it can in this way imitate the movement of the visitor of the build in the building. And you can see that there are some photographs which are framed a little differently from one to another and it, it tries to give the impression of the of, of someone who is uh, entering a building. On, on a, it, it was an experiment which, which was very, um, um, it, gave a, it gave a way to, to a lot of uh, experiments of this, uh, of this kind in, in German books especially. Uh, we will see later that the composition on the double page is taken over by magaz architectural magazine of the 30s, like Casabella, for instance. But did those magazines of the 30s learn all lessons of the experiments brought about by new vision on new typography? So I will come now to, with this transi transition about graphic design, I will come to my next point about modernist magazine of the 30s, which I call, um, I, I, I address the question are those magazines of the 30 established periodical for an established modern architecture? Actually, at the end of the, tw of the 20s, the fall of most avant-garde publications gave way to a more established type of generation of modernist magazines, such as Casabella, Domus, L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui, and so forth. These magazines were less heroic less polemic and less disruptive than the previous one, that the avant-garde magazine, but even there were less disruptive um, uh, than magazine like uh, Das Neue Frankfurt or Atze or Etienne. There, there were more, the, 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 they wanted to be professional and to be more um, uh, anchored in the reality. I would like to try to sketch some features of their identity. Uh, with the exception of the many Belgian titles created since the, the late 20s in support of modern architecture and which do not survive the Second World War, those periodicals of the late 20s last for a remarkably long time. Domus, which was founded, you know that, that better than I do, uh, Domus, which was founded in Ma Milan in 1928, La Casabella, which was founded the same year, L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui, which was published for the first time in, in 1930, but prepared in 1929, 
um, will perpetuate the tradition of both professional magazines on critical journals in Europe in the aftermath of World War II. There was a, a really uh, a continuity of this magazine. Professional on critical as well. This association between the two sides uh, is um, uh, the feature that in the post-war period will distinguish them from the main American trade periodical, for instance. These magazines, founded at the turn of the 30s, are said to be professional in nature. Um, one of the first signs they give uh, to, to, to prove this, this professional um, uh, um, possibility, this professional uh, uh, character, is they, they, they give them an editorial board on, on the patronage committee like l'architecture d'aujourd'hui. Another feature is the very well documented press review uh, they, they edit, a very important source of information. And if you uh, work on magazine, this is also um, a very important part because the discourse of the magazine is not only in the main page of the journal. You have to also to pay attention to these parts because there is, for instance, in La Casabella, Casabella after, it was very important because uh, sometimes um, the, um, the authors couldn't express themselves very freely in the main page, but in these um, side pages of the of the press review, they could, for instance, give more information about international architecture, about German architecture, and so it was a, also a space of expression. But also, it's, um, um, it's a, also a proof of their professional source of information. It's very different uh, of what we saw before, for instance, in Manomet, all the, the, this name dropping, we could say, of uh, uh, those uh, friend magazines. Th this is a, a real analyze. Um, they analyze other magazines, and they, they took information from them, and, and, and they, uh, it, it's, uh, it's really an important part of their uh, editorial policy. Um, so, they are professional, but at the same time, they claim their difference from the leading periodicals, for instance, uh, in France, like La Construction Moderne, L'Architecture, or from, um, in uh, Italy, Architettura e Arti Decorative. But one can say that the document-based magazine distinguishes itself most from the manifesto magazine. By displaying a desire for obje objectivity, by claiming to provide the readers with documents, detailed drawings, that's uh, l'architecture vivante, um, building solutions, reports on foreign news. L'architecture vivante, for instance, which was not really an avant-garde magazine, so it's a um, peculiar case, I must say. L'architecture vivante introduced itself as a reference document, a work tool reserved to the professional elite. By doing so, L'architecture vivante, as well as L'architecture d'aujourd'hui, deny that they are trend magazine. They want to claim professionalism and to distinguish themselves from um, traditional magazine. Uh, manifestos, such as those published in the 20s journals in Switzerland, Germany, and the Netherlands, uh, for instance, ABC, who was calling for the abolition of architecture in favor of building, are certainly no longer on, no longer on the agenda uh, at, this, at the dawn of the next decade. Periodicals, therefore, need to disseminate all kinds of technical information on materials su suitable for the new architecture. All in all, their role is to develop a technical culture in line with this modern architecture. The debate on construction, in France in particular, on the plastic or structural use of reinforced concrete, which a debate which oppose um, Le Corbusier to Perret, to, 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 to say it very uh, quickly, uh, becomes, one of the uh, becomes one of the spearheads of the supporters of a modern and national architecture. In the 30s, uh, magazines like Casabella often help disseminate the foundation of new knowledge in the field of rational housing and city planning. Uh, and uh, Casabella went on with this, task, with this task beyond 1945. 
after 1945, facing the urgency, urgency of reconstruction. Uh, the topic of rational housing will become a priority for, for Construzioni Casabella. And the articles which were um, published in 41 will form the material for several handbooks as it, had, as it has been demonstrated mainly by um, Maristella Casciato in, in her study on the, this, uh, 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 this uh, handbook, uh, uh, Il problema sociale, costruttivo e economico dell'abitazione. Um, therefore, there is a, a kind of uh, translation, a kind of uh, um, reuse of the material of the magazines uh, intended uh, like professional documentation, uh, especially in Italy, uh, just before the Second World War, the, this material were adapted and reused just after the war to provide to the professional uh, 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 documentation for, for uh, rational housing, um, uh, especially. Uh, so, what about now the graphic designs of the late 20s and the 30s magazine? Without getting involved in the graphic and photographic exper experimentation of the avant-garde, and yet benefiting from this experiment, this magazine often favored the use of images to highlight shapes on the modern materials of a new architecture. Nevertheless, it cannot be claimed that those experiments on visual innovations stemming from avant-garde were directly transposed into architectural magazines. Some of these journals, like uh, Itin, Das Neue Frankfurt, or ABC, uh, use graphic and photographing aesthetics uh, stemming from new vision, new vision, objective photography, and functional typography. Such an aesthetics had been first elaborated by the avant-garde artists and then adapted and disseminated amongst a larger aud audience, um, uh, like uh, uh, by advertising magazine and also by illustrated popular magazine. Uh, these journals, uh, advertising magazine, illustrated popular magazine, spread a renovated taste among the public. Yet, when later architectural magazines use this aesthetic, do they, take, do they take full advantage of the new possibilities of perception of the printed document as claimed by the protagonist of the new typography on new photography. We saw before the example of uh, uh, Johannes Molzan and uh, his um, Burkinema uh, device. And uh, my, my question is, is the avant-garde experiment, uh, are, are the avant-garde experimentation used into the 30s, the, the magazine in the 30s? Although architectural history has put into perspective the role of magazines like L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui in advocating the modern movement in the 30s, their graphic design has hardly been analyzed. A common place is that they take on a modern, or I would say modernized form on account of the widespread introduction of photography in ways that corresponded with the modern nature of the editorial content. Yet, uh, we should not overestimate uh, this correspondence. I mean, we should not overestimate the deliberate aesthetic intentionality in this layout. L'architecture d'aujourd'hui has very often been praised as a modernist periodical, either for its architectural discourse, its editorial policy regarding the modern movement, which is, in my view, not so clear-cut, um, on, on its uh, editorial policy has, has already been abundantly discussed. But it was also seen as a modern magazine for its uh, editorial uh, graphic design. That is one of the, one page of the number one. The typographer Jacques Nathan uh, elaborates the layout of l'architecture d'aujourd'hui, which is known as the spiral magazine. Nathan, who is very close to the Union des Artistes Modernes, elaborates it according to the principles on the dominating taste of typography, which is advocated by the Union des Artistes Modernes. From its foundation in 1929, 
the Union des Artistes Modernes, promotes a renovation of typography. Uh, it's not di directly experimental, but it is more based on an alliance with the sphere of industrial production on commercial advertising. The 1932 uh, uh, UAM, uh, Union des Artistes Modernes exhibition, uh, mainly disseminated its principle, uh, its graphic and typographic principle. Um, if the German typo photo and German graphic design was known in France, uh, the introduction of photography of the printed page since the eve of the 20th century, the alliance of typography and photography in France did not give rise to mere experiment experimentation, nor did French graphic designers grasp the political and critical potential of the photomontage. Nor did, nor did they explore photography and type of new devices of vision. This is not due to a complete ignorance of the German or Dutch works in the realm of typography and photography. As the Métier Graphique, founded in 1927 by the, the, front, uh, uh, the, the graphic designer uh, Charles Peignot and Maximilien Vox, broadly disseminated the Dutch typographer uh, Jan Chisch Holt's work, as well as the FIFO exhibition, film and photo exhibition in France. But in the anti-German ideological context of the interwar period, numerous protagonists of French graphic art openly took a stand against functional typography, which was seen as emanating from Germanic, or not German, Germanic culture. This anti-German ideological context reached numerous other cultural fields, among them um, the radical architecture of the Neues Bauern would be denigrated as Teotonic, which is not very kind <laughs> mode of uh, uh, qualifying this architecture, or also Teotonic or Bolshevist architecture as soon as 1931. This corresponds also to the economic crisis. Um, so there was this anti-German uh, context. The, and in France, the, 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 renovate, the renovating of the layouts suffered a lot from, the, from this context. Um, uh, in Italy, the case of Casabella is somehow different since one of his main, its main critic, Eduardo Persico, uh, was really close to um, and aware of German typography, photography, and graphic design. And uh, uh, he, he tried to, to foster on the pages of Casabella, and you see on these pages, which really well not also the logic of uh, the composition on the double page. And uh, instead of the, uh, there is also a logic on uh, of, um, there is also a logic of lecture, of, of dynamic lecture on the pages, but it's more close to a, um, a kind of, it, it's not like Molzan's experimentation on, on, on the, the visual perception of, of, of the reader, but it's more, more close to a com, um, an abstract composition very close to uh, Italian um, abstract movement of the 30s. But anyway, there, there was really a, uh, an essay to, to, um, uh, to, rela to uh, associate Casabella with this European movement on, on typography and on, on, on graphic design. And, uh, also, the, but uh, you, you, know that, you know that better than I do, that uh, uh, Persico was also very close to uh, Campo Grafico, which was a, a very important, uh, um, very important magazine in uh, in the field of uh, graphic design, um, and, and he tried to also to, to transfer in his layout, and you see a Molzan layout on the left, on the Casabella a page of Casabella on the right. He tried to transpose a kind of uh, a similar devices, but you know uh, you you can see that uh, this is a kind of um, there is a, a kind of dynamic perception here, but here in this uh, in this uh, layout, it's quite different because um, it, it takes the, the the same frame, but the um, the the images are very detached. What well, they, they represent 
different buildings, so it's, it's, it's rather, it remains more static. Uh, but anyway, there is a kind of permeability, but in my view, it doesn't uh, draw all the lessons from this, uh, uh, from this experiments. So, uh, next point on the, in this identity, uh, uh, which is the discourse on architecture, the, uh, not only the layout is characteristic of this uh, periodicals of the 30s, but uh, a, turning, a turning point of, of the discourse from new to modern architecture. And the greatest difference of these journals with the avant-garde ones is the, what kind of architecture they do publish. In several European uh, countries, the acceptance and dissemination of radical architecture uh, face oppositions on cultural and ideological levels. This cultural reaction also contribute to shape this generation of journals. Uh, in many ways, these are not only keeping significant distance from the avant-garde, but also gradually from international radical architecture. The discourse on new architecture, and hence the periodicals, are affected by the ideological pressure resulting from rising nationalistic movements and from the ever stricter restrictions imposed by the political and economical context. In France, as early as the 20s, there is a reaction to the international character of new architecture, especially as it is, as it is often viewed as German and Germanic. From the onset, this assimilation trends um, from the onset, sorry, this assimilation tends to go against European architecture, architecture in the vengeful context of the post-war period. This reaction is accompanied uh, by the rejection of the forms of the universalism or internationalism conveyed by the German, Dutch or Swiss avant-garde in the previous uh, year. And uh, this, uh, reject, um, this reaction is translating by French critics um, uh, in form of aesthetics uh, by uniformity uh, uh, on, the, on monotony of the shapes, material or styles, or in other cases by nationalists of xenophobic arguments. The change in the context and doctrinal stance of the periodicals as a consequence. The modern architecture advocated by l'architecte, you, you see a page of l'architecte, which was a kind of moderate uh, journal, or l'architecture d'aujourd'hui is becoming more and more a national modern architecture, and this uh, even before 1933. I, I mean, um, uh, also l'architecture d'aujourd'hui, which is uh, um, of, often praised as a very modernist and international um, uh, journal advocated also a national character of modern architecture. Uh, the architecture of the, the Neues Bauern is seen as an enemy, even as the Trojan horse of the Bolshevism, as states the conservative uh, critic Camille Mauclair. Uh, this is mo the more general French critical context. The debate on the construction, in France in particular, on the plastic or structural use of the reinforced concrete, which opposed uh, Le Corbusier to Perret, becomes one of the spearheads of the partisans of a modernized architecture, uh, especially those who foster an architecture that may be in continuity to the national constructive tra tradition as represented by Perret. In Italy, but I, I won't develop that, but in Italy, in, in, the second half, in the second half of the 20s, the grip of the regime controls more and more the professional cultural, cultural institutions on the media. For instance, the main Italian professional magazine, Architettura e Arti Decorative, which was founded in 1921, becomes in 1927 the voice, even the official organ of the National Labour Union of Fascist Architects. Architectural journals are forced to compromise with the cen censor censorship. Even Casabella has to publish Roman architecture, this is an article by Giuseppe Pagano, to praise the choices of the regime. This incidence of the fascists concern not only academic architecture, but also Italian rationalist architecture. And uh, you can see, for instance, uh, I turn to, I switch to French, uh, uh, 
context, uh, these are pages of uh, l'architecture d'aujourd'hui, which are uh, really, um, um, sorry, I, I can't go back anyway, <laughs> uh, which are really very ambiguous sometimes. Uh, I come to the last point of my presentation, um, uh, and I would like uh, in this slide Point, in this last point to quote one of the first significant studies on architectural periodicals completed in 1975, Le Corbusier et l'Esprit Nouveau, uh, by the is Italian historian Carlo Olmo. Uh, the first edition is in 1975, and in 1988, uh, in the foreword to the third edition, Carlo Olmo pointed out that since 1975, profound changes had taken place in the historiography of modern architecture on the one hand, and in the approaches taken to architectural magazines on the other hand. And I quote Carlo Olmo, history for architects has gradually been replaced by history of architects and of their cultures, particularly graphic, unquote. In Carlo Olmo's words, history for architects is intended as the broad narratives, the genealogies which encompass series of buildings and series of architects qualified as the masters. This way of writing history used to be rather common until the 70s, especially by historians who might be called embedded historians alongside with the architects of the modern movements. It may have directly exploited the periodical as a source, highlighting series of buildings which are reproduced and reiterated. And, and I, I would like to point this, uh, th this was very, a re very common practice to, uh, in some um, um, history's handbook of the 70s, 60s, 70s to, to, to have a direct uh, uh, relation to, to the periodicals and the, the, the images and the series of images which um, would consecrate a kind of genealogy of modern architecture, architecture would be reproduced directly in, in books. So this is history for architects in Carlo Olmo's words. As for history of architects, uh, according to Olmo, it encompasses cultural history of architecture and of the architectural profession. Uh, in fact, there, there have been a lot of outcomes of the history of architectural periodicals in the realm of uh, the history of the profession of, of architecture. Uh, it has contributed a great deal to the history of the profession, for instance, from the 70s onwards, scholarship on periodicals permitted to reassess some assertion common in the historiography of 19th century architecture, like the great divide between architecture of architects and architecture of engineers, the dichotomy between stone decorated architecture and an iron structural one popularized by Siegfried Gideon in his book Bauen in Frankreich, and then reproduced as a commonplace in modernist historiography. Among other scholars, Hélène Lipstadt, and she's a very important scholar for uh, architectural periodicals. So Hélène Lipstadt has, has cast um, court light on the circulation of periodicals on their roles in consecrating the careers of the architects. And she, um, she contributed a great deal to this, this, this uh, very, um, uh, this uh, lieu commun, uh, common place of uh, the, the divide between architects and engineers. Uh, by studying the French architectural press of the 19th century, Hélène Lipstadt was the first scholar to establish a theoretical model of the architectural press conceived as a social institution uh, competing with the academic institution for the consecrations of the architect's careers. And she did this in the, um, in, in the, um, with a, um, she, she used a, a model of Pierre Bourdieu to, 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 uh, to, um, to demonstrate this. Furthermore, as soon as the 70s, scholarship on 19th century magazines contributed to the history of the profession especially in the United States. 
1973, Mary Wood's dissertation on the American Architect and Buildings News showed that the establishment after 1875 of the first long-lasting North American magazines coincided with the structuring the, of the professions and its teaching of the forming of public opinion. And, and there was also a, a great uh, a development of this uh, study of architectural profession from stemming from this study of uh, American uh, journals, on, uh, especially uh, in Mary Wood's uh, dissertation on all the works after that. In the 80s, uh, both art on architecture periodicals could be uh, uh, included in the new objects, new sources, and new method of history related to the 80s boom in cultural history. I, I, I mean cultural hist history not only in the realm of architecture, but more generally. Cultural history saw so political and cultural magazine as the scaffolds of the intellectual field, as the historian of structuralism, Francois Dawes, puts it. Their study reveals both social networks and the intellectual itineraries of their members. History of architects also deals with the history of their visual culture. Since the 19th century, uh, the alliance of the printed material with the technical processes of reproduction images uh, is a really important issue. Uh, Beatrice Colomena, on the one hand, and, and Ellen Lipstadt, on the, on the other hand, and very differently, have investigated this point on different ways. The engraved plate, extremely carefully drawn, for instance, in the Revue Générale de l'Architecture, then in the picture in Testo or as a detached plate, are a constitutive feature of the genre architectural periodical. Uh, not only uh, new approaches on magazines, uh, but also significant upheavals in architectural historiography occurred between the mid 70s and the late 80s. As it, is well known, as it is well known for the 70s onwards, the history of the modern movement has been questioned by a new generation of historians, like Colin Stafuri, Colhoun, etc. On the contrary of Pesner, Gideon, Hitchcock, and so forth, this generation had not been involved in the championing of modern architecture. So, thus, they could abandon the heroic mythographic narratives of the modern movement and began to design a more balanced history of the interwar period. Moreover, I argue that since its very beginnings around 1975, history, the history of periodicals may have contributed to foster this historical revision. It is worth noticing that the avant-garde publications became a favored object of investigation, not only for the fascinating aesthetic objects they constitute. They became a favored object among architectural historians at a time when critical historiography was paying considerable attention to the modern movement. Since the 90s, by studying periodicals of the 30s, Several historians gave light to a more refined view of the so-called modern movement. Moreover, more subtle interpretation of these well-known magazines called into question the previously, um, called into question the previously sharp distinction be drawn between so-called traditionalist magazines and those described as modern or even avant-garde, a term which, in my view, is um, used wrongly for periodical disseminate who disseminate architectural modernity, but also in, who, which integrate kind of tradition or written to order. And that's why I, I'm, I'm, I'm showing this, um, uh, these pictures of l'architecture d'aujourd'hui, which, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, which are really, which show this ambiguity of the positioning of l'architecture d'aujourd'hui, which was not really, uh, um, only a, 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 um, a vector of modern and radical architecture, on the contrary, sometimes. So a more in-depth analysis revealed that the buildings and projects we produce in the magazines didn't perfectly fit in the canonical image of modernity they claim to vehicle. On the opinion of several historians, too simply in my view. 
Several scholars have shed light on the internal contradictions of the editorial boards toward modernism by saying that I have in mind l'architecture d'aujourd'hui. Despite its political ambivalences, it has been often praised as the more modernist on international magazine in France. And that is, that, um, this statement is, in my view, to be, um, to be questioned. And to conclude, uh, magazine in and for history. Uh, I come back to the title of this talk, which I didn't explain till yet. In 2008, when we were writing the introduction of a book on the journals of the 60s and 70s, uh, the Canadian, the Belgian Canadian historian Franz van Latem and I uh, have been advocating a third avenue of research between two main paths of research which were very common. The first one uses periodicals as a source for historiography of the, of the 19th and 20th centuries, while the second considers the magazine as an object to be investigated for itself. The first path that we would like to, um, we, we wanted to, to, to foster would have crossed over the critical contents of the magazine, theories and doctrinal positions, but in relation with the material, economic, social, and visual characteristic of the magazine as an institution. Um, the main part of new scholarships uh, in, the last, uh, in the last 10 years, the main part of the new scholarship on architectural periodicals demonstrate that this avenue of research is now being exploited. They reveal the broadening of the field of studies to new territories. They illustrate as well its con chronological extensions towards the more recent periods with a focus on the relation between postmodernism and architectural magazine. And there has been, uh, for instance, uh, very recently in Lisbon, a, very, a big uh, symposium on architectural periodicals and 80% um, of the papers were on postmodernist. <laughs> Uh, the, the relation between postmodernism on, uh, on magazines. Uh, but what is, in my opinion, more noticeable is that recent research demonstrates new disciplinary and conceptual approaches on the object architectural magazines. So, and uh, uh, on the, they demonstrate also pluridisciplinary uh, 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 kind of uh, approach and uh, also more um, uh, cultural uh, history and, and very interesting um, modes of uh, investigating this object. So I think uh, I will conclude now and uh, I, I thank you for your, your attention. I I spoke too long <laughs> and uh, uh, in, this, in this moment, uh, which is normally dedicated to, to pause. <laughs> Thank you.